Now then, listener, I want to let you know that my book, What a Flanker, is available now in paperback. It's had some great feedback. Rugby World said, what a flanker, what a book. The Telegraph described it as explosive. The Sun said, not for the faint of heart. If you haven't got a copy now, order yours in paperback. Or get it in ebook or audiobook read by me. Thanks for your support. Now on with the show. Hi everyone and welcome to What A Flanker, the podcast series two. My guest today is a leader in the world of health and fitness, a body transformation specialist, power lifter, PT, nutritional guru and founder and global director of the Advanced Coaching Academy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my good friend, former trainer, my former guru, Phil Learning. <laughs> Hey, James, that's a, that's a hell of an intro. That's not going to go on an Instagram bio, is it? Yeah, well, you, know, you wouldn't fit that it's in quite Instagram, expensive. Yeah, that I have is... to abbreviate it into letters of some description. I love that. How are you, though? You well? I'm all right, yeah. Not falling apart during this pandemic? Mm, I, I was falling apart pre-pandemic, but uh, no, I managed to hold everything together, I think. I've seen your um, your social media recently. You've been having a bit of like... I mean, we're going to talk a lot about <laughs> social media in, in the health and fitness industry, and... I don't think I'll touch it now, but I saw a post the other day um, about uh, you've been getting some abuse online, and it, it, it sort of sort of sort of gone more severe than just regular trolling. Yeah, it's. I mean, hell, you you'll have experienced this sort of stuff, but there's been there's been a number of instances over the years that were all quite serious. So this probably the first major one was you know we got a we got a cyber attack. Uh, somebody went went after my website about what will it be two thousand and. Would it be seventeen somewhere on there? Uh, but it was anyway. This guy, this guy attacked our website, and I've got this WhatsApp like late at night, and this WhatsApp's just like, "Hey man, your 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 website's down. It's from a number that I don't recognise." And obviously, when clients or anybody like that or anybody who I work with WhatsApp me, it's it's kind of out the norm, right? Because WhatsApp's sort of a personal thing yeah, you do yeah. with your mates and blah blah blah. So my first sort of response was. How do we go back at this? It's like 10 o'clock at night. And obviously, he's just indicated there's a problem with my site. So I've gone back. I've apologized, said, look, I'll get my IT team on it straight away. So contact the IT guys, said, look, guys, our website's down for some reason. Can you just have a look at it? And they're they're brilliant. They're, they're on it all the time. So they've gone on to it. And then he then continues the conversation. And then slowly, it develops into this quite sinister conversation where he's going, look, he goes... These are the people that are named on your website as admin and blah, blah, blah. And this is where you live. And this is, you know, what your kids' names are. And this is what this, that. So he starts going down this route. And then ultimately it all comes to, and, you know, this went on for ages. And I'm like, look, you need to stop what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. And at this point. Don't I, you were as polite as that. Didn't you say, get fucked, you psychopath? <laughs> <laughs> I just wasn't sure what the tone of the the, the, the podcast oh, was. The so, tone is enemy so yeah, goes, just don't drop the C bomb. Yeah, That's about yeah, the yeah, along those lines, I, I, I sort of said, and you've got to, almost tread a little carefully right because you don't want to antagonize the situation yeah. but you also want to sort of calm it down and sort of say what's what so basically it was a ddos attack which from what i've been told by the the it was the the Met sort of cyber squad they told me that he hijacks a load of computers they hijack a load of other computers and they hijack a load of others and then basically they all it all sounds quite simple because they then just visit your website that's it they just visit your website but because when you set up a website you basically you purchase a certain amount of traffic that the website can handle before it crashes. You know, like when you go and buy, you know, when you you go to buy your take that tickets, right? Yeah. And the website crashes. Never bought take that tickets. Yeah, come on. That's why I <laughs> use that example. So, yeah, a little mix. Fine. And, more, more like that. <laughs> so, so basically there was like millions and millions of visits going to my site every minute, which was crashing the site. And the site was never going to go back up again until he stopped these visits occurring. So we had to wait basically for a, a kind of crack or a, a point where he stopped doing that for us to jump in, put a barrier in the way, and stop it. Thankfully, we did. But the I phoned the cyber crimes unit, and some of the experiences I've had with the police, some of it's brilliant, other times it's very slow, it's very... They were at my house in like 40 minutes. So the, the, there was a guy got on a train from London, turned up at my door 40 minutes later, and he's there taking this statement. And, and I'm like, wow, they're taking this really, really seriously. So he took this statement, next day he returns, he comes back, and he's got a guy from the Australian F Federal Police. So this guy's actually sent me a link to his Facebook on this on this WhatsApp conversation. And I'm like, he's not going to send a link to his Facebook. You know, who's who's going to do that? <laughs> and I've looked at this Facebook, and the Facebook's got, like, pictures of kids on there. And it's been there for eight years. So I'm thinking, oh, it must just be somebody else's. Turns out it's actually him. And we didn't know this at that point. Yeah. 
and it turns out it was actually him. So this guy's been doing it to like multiples of big businesses. So at that point, I'm thinking this must be personal, right? Because why out of all the businesses out there that he could attack and he could go at or whatever it was, he picked mine. And I'm like, you know, we do okay, but he's not going to extort me for silly, silly money. No, no not telephone numbers. No. So he's wanting all this money transferred, Bitcoin, otherwise he's going to continue to do this. He takes down, at that point, I had three other websites live and he took all of those down as well. <laughs> those weren't, you know, as critical to, to the business, blah, blah, blah. So anyways, they, this went on and uh, four years later, he got sentenced. So he has a two-year suspended sentence. And apparently in Australia, that's a big deal. So I had the Australian Federal Police basically came to my door. They kept coming so back. So he was Australian himself? He was, was Australian, it? yeah. Yeah, so he was a guy out in Australia and uh, apparently been attacking loads of people, but nobody would actually press charges. So I was like, no, I'm going to press charges. You know, I want to I want to go after him. I'll do whatever you need me to do. So I just had to fill out statements. You had to go through kind of emotional impact and blah, 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 and all this other stuff, how much money you lost and you know they don't recoup anything they offer you counseling if you want to and all these different things but australian federal police took over and he got nicked it was in all the aussie news and blah 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 he'd been attacking you know multiples of companies and just been really brazen about it and told them who he was so the, <laughs> so they went to his door and apparently the, the the guy from the police told me he goes they went to his door in the middle of the night knocked his door down and took him off in cuffs and i was like wow this is like serious yeah and yeah, he got two years suspended sentence. And apparently in Australia, that's a big, big deal because all of the employers in Australia check your criminal records, which means that he is totally shafted. If he does anything, he said, if he you know if he pisses in a bush and gets caught, he'll go to prison. So so yeah, so that that was kind of that one. And then there's just been there's, there's just been various other bits and pieces along the way. We were you know we were we were part of this whole thing where. We just got abused by this this individual. It kind of was an individual in it, sort of wasn't. There was a whole group of them sort of involved. And it was it just went on for years and years and years. We just disregarded it. I was like, whatever. It's not that mental know. guy that we that, that I know. No. Not that. <laughs> okay. No, 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 no. That was that was in the grand scheme of things, that was just oh, a, fine, whatever fine, it was. Fine, that, okay. was, that was one of them things where, you know, he was tagging me and stuff and blah blah blah. Oh, that, went on, that went on for probably ten or twelve years. And that was just one person yeah. had a chip on his shoulder about me. And I'd only met the guy like once yeah, yeah. ever. And it was just this individual that just, just kept going at us. But it was it was against my wife, it was my kids, it was it was me, it was it was everything. And it, it got to the point where we actually moved house because of it. Because they actually turned up. So we we were told by the police that we should report everything and never retaliate. So we didn't retaliate at any point. I mean, they were sending pen written letters <laughs> to members of our, our family. You know, making up all this stuff about, you know, like I was a some kind of drug dealer and I was extorting all these people and blah, blah, blah. And there was there was this, this whole story around this this thing. And they, they'd basically been sending them on these prime sort of dates. So it was like, you know, when it was the anniversary of people's deaths and oh things like that. Oh, my God. So they'd pinpointed all these, these key dates and were, and were doing all this stuff. So we were told by the police, look, don't retaliate. Don't respond. Don't, don't uh, you know, message back. Don't do anything. So we followed their guidelines to a T. And, and, you know, you wound up, you're like, I want to go to this person's front door and knock their door down and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, right. But I'm not going to do that because they've told me not to. And we'll be the better people here. And we'll we'll just sit back and the police will deal with it. So we did, reported them 23 times, I think it was. 23 times in total. And then the final one was they, when we moved, they used to make a beeline to our house and they used to walk past our house every day. So you knew who it was? We knew who it was, yeah. So they would walk past our house every day and stare through our windows every day. And obviously that's not a crime, right? No. That's not a crime. So, so you know, I can't do anything. They just, my office was at the front of the house and blah, 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 and they just used to walk by and they stare through the windows every single day. So we were up, uh, we were bathing the baby upstairs and their daughter walks by and he's literally just staring right up through this window and we've sort of glanced down and then she stops in her tracks and like starts circle circling where she's at and she just gets on her phone immediately and literally 20 seconds later her mum's the, the the person that was kind of the main key ringleader of all of this turns up on our driveway like 20 seconds later so this has all been planned you know there was no it wasn't it wasn't oh i phoned them and they've they've put their clothes on and came out the door and this was like late at night yeah you know, we're, we're we're batting the baby 
and they start hurling abuse through our top window you know like calling all sorts of things you know calling my wife this that the other blah 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 and then he turns up the husband turns up on the on the driveway starts calling me starts calling me a pedophile oh. doing all this stuff and he's shouting it at the top of his voice around all our neighbors right so he's there on the on the driveway giving it all this so i said to my wife I said look you stay put. I said, I'm going downstairs. I'm going to go and deal with this. And I'm going to phone the police. So I walked onto the lawn. I'm phoning the police. He's like in my face, blah, blah, blah. And then he he launches at me, like scratches all my arms, blah, blah, blah. And I, you know, I'm twice the size he was. Yeah. So I just grabbed him and threw him like 10 foot. <laughs> and police turn up. They kind of, you know, they do their thing where they're sort of, oh, it, you know, we're not going to take a side here. So, you know. And I'm saying about all these previous incidences. One of them was, uh, you know, they'd walk past my wife in town while she was at a cash point, and my my other daughter was there with the pram. She tried to knock the pram over with the baby in it. So there was, there was all of this. So major drama, blah blah blah. Ended up with this thing on the lawn. So I'm like, look, I'm going to press charges. It's you know, it's a type of, it's not a b h, but it's a type of you know assault. Yeah. Which you should theoretically get you know uh either sentence for or fine for yeah. or whatever it might be so we get a phone call from the the person in charge of it they said yeah so they've got a warning and that's it so i said hold on whoa we've reported these people like 23 24 times i said and, and nothing's happened she said oh i didn't look at all those <laughs> and that was the response right so for years and years and years we haven't retaliated hadn't done anything and we just said look stop this we're just going to move so we've moved, we've made our address, we've filled out all these court forms and things like this, and our address is basically no one knows our address. And, you know, we live, you know, several miles away from where we were before and touch wood so far, you know, nothing. But then then we've had uh, probably about a week or so ago, we just got this random message off this, we clearly sort of fake social media account, and it's making threats towards my son. Oh, God. So it's all this, all this drama, you know, making accusations about this, that, the other, about you know, and it then turns a bit sour. This the person that messaged made out that he was somebody that he wasn't. He was like made out he was a friend of a friend, and he wasn't. So I said, "What's your full name?" So I asked him what his full name was. So so he he told us what his full name was, where he lived, and blah blah blah. And obviously you know that if you were that person. So he just creates this name and blah blah blah, and then goes off on a complete tangent. And start sending pictures of of what he's alluding to be him firing these semi-automatic weapons and you know shooting handguns like proper proper weaponry and then several fake accounts all of a sudden crop up and start messaging us and it's all like you know we're gonna cut you up and we're gonna attack, you know watch your back blah 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 and it was i think it was 15 accounts that it came from different different messages clearly you know same vocabulary, same kind of slang, blah, 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 all pretty much, you know, and you can see on Instagram accounts when they've just been created, it says new Instagram account, yeah. new Instagram account. They've got like, they're following about 50 people, but no one follows them yeah, and yeah. blah, blah, blah. They've all got funky names. And so we've reported it. So I said, look, this is getting ridiculous. I said, I'm going to report it. And then I've, we've got into bed at, you know, 10 o'clock at night or whatever it might be. I've gone into my social feed and they've commented literally all over my social channel like making accusations towards my son and blah, 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 and all, literally hundreds of messages. So I'm like, and of course I've got to block them all. And the police tell you, don't block them because then we need to be able to see them and blah, 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 don't retaliate, don't do this, that, the other. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's been, you know, so it's been interesting. So I thought, right, I'm going to share this. I'm just going to share it because this is something that I think a lot of people contend with, you know, I'd, I'd I don't live in this deluded world where I'm like, oh my God, all these people are just target us and all this shit and why is it always us? That is my mindset. I don't think like that. I think, look, people are dealing with shit all the time and whatever it might be, it could be family, external parties, it could be, you know, finances, whatever. People are contending with shit all the time that just goes under the radar. People look at social media and see this kind of, you know, this ideal world scenario that they're all painting and blah, blah, blah. And everyone's contending. And you might look from the outside and go, oh, my God, your life's so wonderful. You know, I'm sure if people look at you and Chloe and go, oh, my God, you know, you're in this great relationship. Uh, you know, you're super successful. There's all this stuff going on. But you're contending with shit. Everybody yeah. contends with shit, right? Yeah. You know, whatever it might be, from whatever angle. And when, when you think there's no shit to contend with, some shit turns up. Yeah. And something happens, right? And there's always drama. And I thought, right, 
I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to share it. I'm going to say, look, these are these quite poignant numbers. This is the number of times that we've reported things to the police. This is the number of times, you know, this is the number of years someone's been. And I just put it up there. And it wasn't It wasn't like this, oh, you know, crime river. Well, it was you me, know, play, yeah, yeah. Play me a violin, blah, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, it was, look, this is the reality. I said, you can look from the outside. And ultimately, when I think a lot of this stuff stems from people's, you know, people's jealousy, People don't like other people being happy. I think that's a general yep. you know, consensus. People don't like to see other Especially people Especially in the happy. UK, tall poppy syndrome. Yep. Yep. People don't like pe seeing people succeed, and people don't like any of that, especially when it's culminated together, right? Yeah. You know, and, and they just don't like that. So they become jealous or whatever it might be. But then on the other side of things is that, you know, I grew up in, in a funny environment in that, you know, I contended with a lot of bullying and shit like that. And, and I think in the grand scheme, you look at it nowadays, it was probably very minimal. Yeah. Because I think that has now escalated. The idea of what bullying is now yeah. is a whole different ballpark. But, you know, and I was, you know, I was overweight as a kid. And again, you know, we can talk about that. That's later, what I want to talk. Yeah, I do want but, to cover that. But, yeah. but being overweight as a kid back then is just kind of normal now. You know, yeah. it was, I was the standout kid at school that was big and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I think I shared one of the pictures with you yesterday. Yeah. Of, you know, I've been digging out some old, there was some old rugby pictures turned up on one of the, 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 the social groups that I follow, which is my old rugby club, old, old rugby club. And it was me playing mini rugby. And there was some pictures and you look at me and if you compared me to the average size of kids nowadays, I was probably fairly normal. Hmm. But in back then, I was the standout kid. I was the big kid. So I was targeted and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and it was, it was tough because there wasn't there wasn't any comparable. So people go, well, it was never as bad. It, no, it wasn't as bad, but there was no comparable. Yeah, it's, it's 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 contextual and relevant to your time, of course. Which people forget. That's why it's, I think it's interesting with all the stuff that we that we some of the stuff we rightly need to change in in, in social situations at the moment with, with Black Lives Matter, with with women in, in, in workplaces, and all this kind of stuff with history and past. You can't hold people accountable for the past to now standards because it's not contextual. So what, what we see now as bullying was as relevant to you then, but it's people have different experiences of it now. And they people get forget that. Well, it was different back then. Yeah, it was different back then, but it was different for everybody back then. Yeah, you yeah. can't you can't do that. So that's um that's really and, interesting. And that's what social's done, right? Yeah. Social has basically removed context from yes. pretty much every single situation that ever gets discussed or becomes a topic of interest on social media. They remove all context. Which makes it a little fiery, right? Yeah, a little fiery. You know what I mean? Because yeah. straight away you've just got to look, I'm going to remove this from this, which makes it then a little bit political or a little yeah. bit whatever it might be. And that's what people do on social. And unfortunately, that, that puts us in a real sticky situation because there's certain things that people want to have voices about. Nobody, you know, there's a lot of stuff that I'd like to talk about on social media, but, but reality is I don't have time to contend with the fallout. Yeah. I just don't want to discuss it because I know what's going to happen. It's going to go ridiculous and i want to put my point across and i want to discuss things but it doesn't end up a discussion no you know and that's why and we talked about this earlier is that's why you avoid that kind of aspect of things so what's happening slowly i think is that the discussion element of social media is now starting to deteriorate because people don't want to talk about serious things you know, like politics you know when the when you know when all the the stuff was going on with with voting and with you know us and uk yeah. and everybody was talking about the government and blah 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 if you told people what your position was and why all of a sudden your friend list would just go doo -doo -doo. yeah and i'm like well you know i don't really mind what people's views are because again it's context right is that you you choose your political allegiance and i don't ever think i have a political allegiance i just i look at who are the candidates and if you have a political allegiance, you're always going to be biased, right? And this is what you try and do in science. And we talk, you know, mm. when you talk about science and you talk about all these things, is that you've got to look at things without bias. That's the whole idea. Critical thinking. That is what critical thinking is all about. Be able to look at something without any bias. Now, if I walk around and say, look, you know, I'm Tory, I'm Labour, I'm this, that, the other, or US, I'm democratic, or whatever, all of a sudden now, it doesn't matter who's leading that party at that particular time, I'm still going to favour them. Mm. I'm like, but I don't like that person. Yeah. But I'm going to favour them because I've picked that team. Yeah. yeah, And it's ridiculous. And yeah. then everybody's like, well, you don't follow my team. You don't pick my team. I'm like, look, there was there were certain things that I agreed with. There was a whole ton of things I disagreed with. But ultimately, when it came to voting, particularly in this country for me, and again, I don't want to get into politics, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
But it, it just came to the best of a bad bunch yeah. for me. It was literally, it was this, who's going to do the most damage? Mine comes down to who's trying to take most of your cash. That, that's where that's the foundation block. But but, but then you couldn't put that view no, on no. social media because people are like, well, yeah, yeah I expect that. You've got social that from, responsibility and all yeah. that shit. Yeah, I, I expect mean, that from somebody who's clearly done quite well yeah, and obviously yeah. makes quite a bit of money, yeah. right? Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, look, so obviously we've gone off on the tangent, but I, the reason I wanted to talk to you about this is so, so I gave you an introduction, and I said PT, you know, body transformation specialist, but you're so, so much more than that. Our, our relationship started when um, I was coming back from injury. We have a mutual physio, a legend of a man called Kevin Lidlow. I talk about him in my autobiography. I talked about you in, in my autobiography about the guys that I was lucky to surround myself with and look for in my t- career to help me get better. And you actually brought me back from um, uh, a knee injury. We started training. I remember six in the morning at... Uh, uh, ultimate fit. Was it was called um, ultimate performance. Ultimate performance. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit, Nick's gonna kill me. <laughs> ultimate performance um, in in Mayfair, and, and we sort of bonded. And, and you've been kind of my go-to uh, man in terms of nutrition and performance. And you've obviously set up your own kind of coaching academy, and you're on the front line of a lot of this stuff. But what I want to do is, is bring you back to, to to the beginning, really, and just talk a little bit about you know how you started and what you what is your sort of specialist specialist skill, really. Wow. Uh, okay. So. This all started with me being stuck for what kind of profession to get into. You know, I was very creative, so my first choice of profession that I wanted to get into was graphic design. Did a couple of work placements, hated it, because it was all going to computers at that point. This is showing my age. It was, everybody was going to computers, and obviously I've been used to working on, like, an Acorn Electron or a BBC or whatever it might be, and they're sticking me in front of these Macs, and I think you remember the old Macs with the big backs, their glow backs and blah, blah, blah. They stuck me in one of them. I'm like, I have no idea how to use this. You know, I don't know how to use a mouse, anything. So I hated it. So then I was like, right, I need to make a call here because at that point you were getting this pressure put on you as to what are you going to do when you leave school? So I opted for, I did A-level PE, took next year at school, which meant I could play rugby for another year, which was, which was again, an entertaining story in many respects. But there was about eight of us took next year at school so we could do PA, uh, A-level PE, which meant I didn't need to then do an HND to get onto a degree course. So rather than going to college for a year, I just took an extra year at school. Took an extra year at school, then got onto a degree in sport and exercise science. So I went off, did that. Uh, wanted to work with athletes. That was always, you know, I wanted to work with pro athletes. That was always my focus because I'd been, you know, heavy into sport. I'd understood quite a lot about sports performance. I'd been privy to some uh, sort of elite level sport in this country, certainly like the England rugby camps. Uh, you know, I did trials for uh, North of England and various bits and pieces. And these things impressed me as to how they're doing stuff. Uh, did a bit of work with kind of England cricket and, and, and other bits. And I, I really enjoyed all that. But then, Reality kind of sunk in in that professional sports as a coach or a trainer, as it was back then, was really a, a badly paid job if there was a job going at all. So it was either move to America and do it in the US, which, again, at that point, even college coaches and strength and conditioning coaches at college were getting paid like six-figure sums and blah, blah, blah. And at, at that point, a six-figure sum to me was going to be mm. like a big deal. It was, you know, so for me, I was quite happy just to earn a regular living. So... It kind of ended up being personal training. And I went to, uh, I finished university, I went back home, I got a job at a local, what was like a leisure centre, but it was was part of a hotel. And uh, I set off there, they didn't do personal training. I said I wanted to do personal training. They said, we're not going to do it because it'll, you know, there isn't the demand for it. I said, I think there is the demand for it. Demanded that they did it. Said I'd leave if not. So they let me do it and then ended up helping them, you know, do that across the whole range of hotels that they had, the whole chain of, of hotels so that kind of i got a bit of management experience etc etc and then i helped them open a gym up in leeds ended up moving to leeds did a bit there and along the way was was working probably more with like physique competitors because obviously at that point professional sport you know outside of probably rugby and maybe football uh there was no money game getting put into snc you know there was there was track coaches you know, for track and field, it was track coaches because you know athletics was quite a big thing. There was all of that, but again, it wasn't a wasn't a job as such. And, and again, I don't mean any disrespect to the people that did that, but you weren't going to earn a lot of money, and you had no real where to. There was nowhere to go after after coaching. You'd be a coach of an athlete for years and years and years, and that'd be it. You retire and blah blah blah. So it kind of stemmed from that. And then along the way, I, I dealt with a lot of physique competitors, and then randomly just kept on getting athletes 
which was my bread and butter, which was the stuff I educated myself about, which was the stuff I was hugely interested in, did sport and exercise science. So I understood kind of heavy anatomy. I understood, you know, biological systems. I understood nutrition quite in depth. And it was all of that. So I was fortunate in that I got to continue and keep that skill quite high. And I also applied it to myself and powerlifting and blah, blah, blah. And then... Because you were a big part. I think you were on the, you, went, you went pretty mad on the powerlifting. If I yeah, remember. well, there was a point there where I just... I retired from rugby. So I stopped playing rugby because it was... I played National 1 and then and then went to National 2 because the club was closer to home. So I played at Oral when I lived up in Cumbria. So you can imagine I was getting in the... Like you, when you went mm. to, first went to Northampton, right? Is that I was travelling on a Tuesday and Thursday night for training, you know, a four, four to five hour round trip to go training and then we train for three four hours then drive back so i was getting in at midnight and then on weekends we were you know we'd have like extra away so extra away was i would drive all the way down to wigan so me and my you know me and my mate who played there so we had a club car we'd drive all the way down to wigan we'd get in there on the bus the bus would leave on friday afternoon so then that started to scoop on my personal training because i couldn't see clients mm. on a weekend then i couldn't see clients in the evening or whatever it might be so i was like look I can't continue to do this. And at that time, uh, you'll probably remember this, but Oral was struggling for money. So mm. they, were, they were struggling to pay the players and et cetera, et cetera. And I was kind of on the cusp of the second to the first team. So I was bouncing between being on the bench for the first and playing predominantly in the seconds. So then I was like, right, I need to get a club close to home. And the closest club was National 2 was Kendall. So I went to Kendall. I played a couple of seasons there. They tried to move across to Hooker because, again, I wasn't very big for a prop. And... I think the first. I forgot you played Rob. Fuck, yeah. mate. Oh my god. First game I played at Hooker, so they were like, "Look, we we want you to move to Hooker." And, yeah. You know, I was I was quite I had good ball skills, and they took me in front of the line. I'm like, put it wherever you want it, and I had quite good ball skills. So we're like, we'll move you across to Hooker now. Hooker obviously is a massive technical. You know, scrummaging is a technical thing, and I'd spent my years as a loose head prop. You know, I was like a specific prop. I didn't do tight head. Yeah. Because I wasn't very good at it, but loose head. You know, I could I could mess up guys like twice the size of me because it was all technique for yeah. me. So I'd get angles and I was always pretty strong and blah, blah. So the movie across to Hooker, first game with Hooker was against Jeff Probin. Oh, shut up. <laughs> Jeff, the judge. Jeff Probin, oh who absolutely massacred me. So he was like, you know, he was standing all over me. He was punching me. He was gouging me. <laughs> And then you know he became head disciplinary. Um, Did he for for, uh, for the RFU? He was a head disciplinary officer. <laughs> There's nothing better than you sitting in a in a disciplinary meeting with the judge and, and the guys, and you're like, uh, "What didn't you used to rip people's heads off?" And yeah. you're like, oh, "Yeah, he was nasty." Yeah. And then I, I thought, right, I was ten minutes in, and you know when it just starts the, and at, at Hooker you've got nowhere to go. I couldn't, you know, I, I, I'd have to break my binding, and so I was ten minutes in, and the guys next to me know full well who this guy is. And I knew who he was, and I was like, right, I either just deal with this for the next 70 minutes or I'm just going to go at him. So I went at him. So I broke my bound, bind in and just went at him. And then from that point forward, obviously there was a bit of a scuffle, blah, blah, blah. From that point forward, it didn't touch me. And it wasn't like I got on top of him. It was just like this, there was this mutual, because I think he, he'd obviously moved down the leagues yeah. at that point. And it was just that this mutual respect where he was like, right, I'm not going to stand all over you now. I'm going to pick someone else and do it to them instead. I so, love that. I love that. Actually, I got sorry. Because Jeff Probin was the disciplinary, but I think the judge, we look at the judge, it's Paul Rendell. So Paul Rendell and Jeff Probin were similar sort of generations. I've met both of them. Paul's lovely, but Jeff Probin, he, I've sat in disciplinary meetings when he's like gone, gone for stuff, and like everybody laughs because he was that kind of tough oh, mentality. He was yeah. like vicious bloke. You know, the only time that I ever experienced that kind of is when we were at school and we played an Argentinian touring team. My God, they were brutal. So I caught the ball off kickoff, took it in, and obviously, you know, you go to ground, go to ground, then I've kind of went to get up, couldn't get up, and there's this kid who's like, you know, he's, I think it was their number eight or back row, and, you know, it's quite a big dude, and this was, I think, 15, and it was this Tory team, and I couldn't get up, and I'm like, why can't I get up? And I look around, and this guy's kneeling on me, this is off kickoff, the guy's kneeling on me, and he just goes, bang, right in my face, like, and, and <laughs> schoolboy rugby at that point, yeah. there was scuffles, and the yeah, guy, not like this that, was like, and I'm like, Okay, so I get up, and within ten minutes, and we had the we had the most strict a guy you may have probably crossed paths with, a guy called Pete Kremer. I know the name. I don't think I've met him in person. Right. So so Pete was like, you you were disciplined. You did not if you went to hit someone or anything like that. You didn't play rugby for the next three games. Yeah. He was like super disciplined, and I remember at half time he turned around to us all and said, "Look, lads, do whatever you want." <laughs> and that's the only time I've ever, I I ever heard him. And, you know, do what you want. And, and he just said, look, do what you want. And, uh, you know, 
you know, he died, you know, years later. And it was, you know, he was an incredible chap, but he was the coach of Kendall as well. Oh, amazing. So he was, uh, so yeah, it was, and then they moved across the thing and then uh, I retired from rugby. So at that point, I didn't have anything to train for. So I thought, right, I'll give bodybuilding a go. So I gave a year of like doing bodybuilding and kind of hated it completely. I liked the discipline of it, but then I just went to powerlifting and powerlifting was my thing after that. So I think I powerlifted for about four or five years, did okay. Uh, there was loads of federations at the time. So, you know, to say I won the British one year for my weight class, to say that is kind of a bit odd because there was multiple federations. So it was about five British champions all at once. So it was, but yeah, I did all right. Uh, you know, bench, squat, dead, you know, you had your specialist one, deadlift was always mine, but but yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. But then massive training time, right? We were talking about yeah. this before with you, you were the, uh, the 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 MMA. Is that it's just a massive commitment. We yeah. would go up there, and when it was equipped, so we used to wear like the suits and blah blah blah, and you, you you competed in non-equipped and equipped competitions, and we'd go to an equipped competition, and and the training for the equipped competition it would take you literally like two hours for you to be getting your gear on and off. You put plastic bags in your legs to pull this stuff up. Have you ever seen any of those? I've seen I've seen the ones with the um for the chest. Where they put the, they put the you know the the, the chest strap things. I've yeah. not seen anything else. Oh, though. it's oh no, not not straps. These are like shirts. Oh yeah, you, but what I mean is they put them over. Yeah, it. So, yeah, so yeah. Your, your arms go in there. Yeah, I've seen that. That's this, all I've it's, seen. It's this super tight canvas that you've literally got to put. You put plastic bags so the canvas will slide against the plastic bag, but it will take all your skin with it. It's brutal, and you, you'd come out, you'd have like lacerations all over you wear these suits, and obviously you got used to it. But it was just, and then. Again, that just became a time constraint. It was just like the massive thing. I used to travel up into you know West London to do it at uh, Genesis. You've trained at Genesis, yeah. I think, before. And and the guys up there, there was a great squad, great camaraderie. And it was the closest I'd ever been to playing team sports again that I'd ever been at. It was like this whole unit. And everybody was really nice. It was like, you know, the world of strongman and powerlifting, and even though there's these big dudes everywhere, it's like everybody's really nice to everybody yeah. and everybody's encouraging you obviously when you get on the platform and everybody's lifting there's a bit of competition but there's never anything nasty really yeah. so it was uh so yeah so i went down that route and, and and powerlifting was my thing but it was always sports it was always sports that i wanted to to do and i always wanted to coach athletes so i was but how, but obviously you said at the start that you started from uh, out overweight and then to to obviously want to work with athletes but then spend a predominantly uh, large amount of your time with physique people changing people's body transformations how did you find that um yourself kind of wanting to change your body because i assume that was a driving factor if you never to be overweight because you said you were bullied yeah um and then wanting to go into physique versus athletes because what what we always talked about when we first started was before i met you I was trying to have a men's health cover model rig, <laughs> albeit not the boat race <laughs> to match it, yeah. but but trying to be a performance <laughs> athlete. And I was the perfect synergy of meeting those two worlds for you to go, you, I'm a predominantly an athlete, why the fuck are you training like you are a, a physique person? So I want to hear about your your journey and, and what drove you, you know, was it the bullying to get into that? And, what, and how did you marry up so two totally different ways of operating with your clients it was because it was it was just a it was a life-changing experience going to the gym for me was a life-changing experience you know on so many levels like mental physical everything and it wasn't just about the you know first thing is is obviously you know we were kids so the first thing is all of a sudden people get word that you go to the gym right people get word you're getting strong people get word you know so all of a sudden people start to be a little bit careful with what they say to you you know so there's that element and then there's the confidence element where all of a sudden, I'm like, I feel better about myself. You know, my knees don't, you know, I had odds good slatters when I was a kid, so my knee cap would, like, float around all the time. And that started to get better. And then there was all these other aspects. And then I started to become more confident in the things I did. So, like, school, I was like, I can, almost this mentality of I can do this instead of listening to people telling me I can't do this. So I now have this mentality where if somebody tells me I can't do something, I'll prove them wrong. And, you know, there's an interesting story with with, with cricket that, you know, I've, I've talked to people about before where somebody had told me, huge respect, they told me years and years and years ago, I'd never become a cricketer. I, two years later, I was playing for the county. Two years after that, I was cap captain in my county. Year after that, I played minor counties. Year after that, I was playing Northern League. And then I just retired. Just didn't, didn't bat an alley. Just was like, right, I'm done. Prove my point, I'm out. And it was just this whole psychological thing where I just had to prove this point to this individual who probably didn't even realise it was about them and just retired from it. But it, people have that mentality and it's like growth versus fixed mindset, right? So it developed my mindset and that was a major thing. So in doing so, that was then 
carried over into how I was treating and dealing with people. So people wanted to change their physiques. So I'd look at people and, and you know, early doors, it was like, look, people just want to be ripped. They want to come in, they want to look shredded, they want to look this, that, that. And that was in my head. Really what people wanted was to be in control of the way they looked. So they wanted to regulate it a bit. They wanted to feel more confident. They wanted to have more, uh, you know, energy and all these different things and all these wishy-washy things that people think that it's not about, when in fact it actually is about mm. that. It is about that because we all realize that their life starts to change. Along the way, there's been a few people who've transformed and kind of mentally gone the wrong way. They turn into complete pricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. they do. Yeah. People lose weight and they turn into complete pricks because yeah. now all of a sudden they're... It's like this extreme of personality where they've just gone... I was once, I didn't have all, you know any of this confidence and blah, blah, blah. Now what I've done, I've overcompensated and I've came out the other end and I've lost all this weight. Now I'm an arrogant prick. And there was, the, and, and I wrote this thing about this enzyme being broken down. There were all these nutritional, you know, and I had all these nutritional people followed me. They were like, what are you on about? I said, look, it's, it's fictional. I created this enzyme, which is basically turns people into an asshole when they lose weight. It gets freed up when fat mobilizes, blah, blah, blah. And I created this whole story about it. But it, this is what would actually happen. So obviously you're trying to get people to the point of being confident about themselves, but then y y people overreach and they, they, they get this arrogance and they turn into being pricks because of it all. And you want to kind of find that happy medium. So along the way, you, you see this mental and this physical transformation of these people and you start to experience all of this. And then dot into that, the the athletes, and then an athlete is a completely different ballpark. And and I'd always say there was, there was, there was sort of four different people I dealt with. I dealt with people who were physique and extreme physiques. So at both ends of the spectrum, they wanted to lose huge amounts of weight, whatever it might be. Then we've got general pop, which are just people who want to feel and look better about themselves. They might have these aspirations when they walk in, but what happens is over time, they realize that the things they would need to give up and commit to in order to get to this end product, which is this physique, is kind of pointless and it doesn't serve their purpose. You know, So they're like, look, so if I get to this point and I want to maintain this point, I'm not going to be able to do this very often in the future. And I want to do that a couple of times a week. So they, they slowly grasp that. And as long as you nurture them along that way, they get happy to where they are. And, you know, when I retired from personal training, a lot of my clients have been with me a long time and they got to that point. So there was no like drastic transformations coming from me at that point because these were just clients that would stick with me because I could regulate and manage their days. You know, so when they were traveling, when things would normally go pear-shaped over Christmas, when things would normally go pear-shaped, I'd teach them how to manage it. So there was that aspect. Then you've got the physique extremes, then you've got the athletes, and then you've got the, the body transformation stuff who've got a good trade-off, which are people like actors and actresses, which, again, I was fortunate enough to work with, is that you've got these people that come to you and go, right, I need to look this particular way. And this would always be my question to even general public is, what's the trade-off? And this is a conversation I have with you. Mm. I remember the conversation I have with you, and I'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But what it was, it was, what is the trade-off and what are you going to get at the end of it? So they're going to get this, you know, millions of pounds for this movie, and it could be a career-defining moment. I'm like, that's a good enough trade-off. So what we're going to do is we're going to diet in a way that is non-sustainable. You're going to get to the end of it. You're probably going to have some problems at the end of it with and relationships with food. You know, uh, again, not someone I work with, but Christian Bale's a prime example of that. Had loads of issues with food because he's gone from these extremes. You know, hugely muscled to, you know, in the machinist, he was yeah. like six stone or seven stone or something like that. It was ridiculous. You know, was consuming like 200 calories a day, an apple and, and several liters of water and you know there's these extremes but the trade-off is good because these are career defining things a bodybuilder of physique competition that's not career defining very few people will ever make a living out of that you know you win the olympia that is not a career defining moment it might be that in that world you become the pinnacle of something but they won't make money from being that physique they'll make money from their personality and getting sponsorship deals and all those other bits and bobs so then you've got athletes. Now, athletes, are, it's an incredible one because especially when you deal with people in particular sports and things like this, because then I could go back to the stuff that I learned about and the stuff I studied and the stuff that I really analysed. And I remember working with an ultra runner and in the ultra runner, was, it was things like we had to look at uh, ambient temperature where she was going to be competing. We need to look at humidity. We need to look at all these different things. We need to look at fluid loss. So we determined things like hy hypertonic, hypertonic, or hypotonic drinks, when and where she would consume them. And it, you just get engrossed in it. So when I started working with you, it was like, you know, I'd sit and watch videos of you playing. And, you know, and, and it's often the groundwork. And it, it was the same kind of with clients. You do the research on what were their days and how do their days pan out and what do they look like. And, how, and then that regulates controlling things like diet better. I'd never be concerned about what they were eating and when. I'd be more about who were they eating with, why were they eating it. 
you know, under what circumstances they're eating it. That's more important to me because that means I can manage things long term. So with an athlete, you're looking at, you're just looking for weaknesses. Hmm. I'm not going to try and make you stronger because ultimately when you sign that professional contract, you are probably pretty much as good as you're going to get, give or take maybe 10% improvement, hmm. right? So I'm looking at the things that are going to keep you on the field of play. And Kevin will just talk about this as well, is that it's largely prehab. So I'm going to look at you and I'm going to go, right, I want to spot every single weak point you've got that ultimately, if you continue training the way you are with a bunch of more than likely yes people around you, so yeah. you'd have all these S&C coaches, which are normally young kids at these clubs because it was this burgeoning career path. They weren't getting paid very well, so therefore they were like, oh, I've got all these players around me that I thoroughly worship. People would be like, oh, it's James. James, what would you like to do today? And you'd be like, right. I'm good at this, 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 so I want to do these. Yeah. You know, I want to be the man in the gym who's, you know, deadlifting this or whatever yeah. it might be. So what would happen is those imbalances get more and more extreme until eventually you got injured. So my job as a coach at that point was I'd get someone and, and often it would be because of an injury. So I used to get referrals off Kevin. So he'd tell me what was wrong. He'd go, T here's what was wrong. I'd then go back, I'd study footage of these people, see how they move, see how they perform, see what they're good at, see what they're bad at. And... It became very easy then to, to to isolate the things that they needed to work on. So we'd do the rehab, and whilst we're doing the rehab, we'd do the strengthening stuff, which would then ultimately eradicate or to attempt mm. to eradicate that discrepancy they had physiologically. So for you, it was this, it was just this analysis, and yours was quite an easy one in many respects. It was just a posterior problem. It was as soon as you remember that, I was going to say it was the posterior chain stuff. You yeah. know that I'd I'd spent all my time doing squats. And, you know, bench and these kind of other things. And because and I'd spent such a large majority of the time focusing on just getting big. You know, Warren Gatton, who who we're gonna, I'm going to interview for, for um, the What Flank of the Podcast, it, you know, we're going to talk about some stuff. But he locked me in the gym with Tom Reese. You know, and we're like, we're not going to play any rugby. You're not going to do any conditioning. You're going to spend six, seven months getting big. And, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some of the mentality around body image. But once you're a bloke and you get into that, you want to get bigger. It's all you start yeah, thinking yeah. about. So I then went to that, started um, started playing. When I came back to, to England after my time in France, I had that you know, terrible tendonitis, had to have um, knee surgery. And the first time I remember you watching footage, you just go, you've got no hamstring strength. You've got no glute, you know, your yeah. glutes aren't weak. Your glutes, glutes are weak. And do you remember, I remember we did those uh, warm-up, uh, you know, in sort of a, almost a sprinter stance with both, you know, four points, knees underneath, knees to the side. Yeah. And I was fucking blowing out my ass. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And I remember you analysing it. And it completely changed the way... Um, I approached things and the improvement I made to the point where, A, you changed my nutrition um, to the point where it was much more focused around performance, much more calculated. So my body changed. And bizarrely, we didn't intentionally try to get me into the best like aesthetic shape, but I, I ended up doing that because I, my diet was a spot on. And we ended up changing the way I... Um, the way I performed, so much so that Was had no idea that I was coming to see you at six in the morning. <laughs> so I'd wait, I was in, I was at least to live in, in Berkshire. So I'd get on the car in my, I think I had a Vauxhall Astra, or I might have had an Audi then, I don't know, but it wasn't, it wasn't great. Whiz, go with the Audi. Well, with the, <laughs> go with the Audi. Whizzing up to you in, in, in Mayfair, you know, ultimate performance, down, you know, down the steps, meet up with you, train, then drive to Was uh, for sort of uh, 7 30, 8 o'clock for my weight session. And they'd be like, You've been training? I was like, No. <laughs> and then I'd go and do the, the rehab, and then I ended up coming back and playing some of my kind of best rugby, and it sort of it sort of set me up. But that exposure to you in that period of time changed all the, my professional approaches from then on. Understanding that if I fueled myself well, this is the results I get. That actually I could maintain a a, a good physique, but with a performance my, performance mindset. That actually shit that I put to one side and say was focus on bodybuilding. That it didn't matter how much I was lifting or how much I was benching. If I fucking couldn't run properly, if my body didn't function, it was it was it was irrelevant. And there were some sort of amazing lessons I learned from you from that period. And you've got to learn that that you know a bodybuilding approach was at that particular time, you know, period of time was very much this bulk and cut approach. So if you wanted to build muscle tissue, you kind of sacrificed a little bit of you know being lean right and the problem is, is that as an athlete you've got this you know i remember this discussion with you and several other athletes really is that the, there's this thing where your trade-off is you earn your living from this is that if we make you too lean all of a sudden we, you become more susceptible to injury you're not as well fueled as you could be and all these other different things and the thing was is that you were you were strutting around probably genetically right at the top of the tree you know i remember having a picture taken here 
we, next to you and people were you know there was so many people you was asking and, and i know you were like targeted with drugs tests mm. you know countlessly because you were one of the guys with a decent rig and yeah. you, know, you you were big and blah 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 so everybody was like you know oh, haskell you know prime <laughs> let's test him yeah yeah let's him let's him with some random testing and 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 i know this happened in rugby yeah. is, they, is that they pick the guys that were jacked and they, they look yeah. the part and, and you know i've never met anybody as paranoid about what they're taking as you i don't yeah. think you know it was like what's in this green string and it was <laughs> yeah, like, yeah you know and there was a whole paranoia about it all but i remember this picture being taken with you and then at, at that point i remember when people used to ask me because people were, you know they come up to you they're all coy and yeah you know they're like oh you know oh, don't want to ask what you used to do and i remember the, this was a conversation years and years before where there was a there was a, a lady i've been dealing with who got super super lean got in great shape and i remember people coming up to me and whispering god what is it she's doing and I used to whisper back and go, "What I tell her?" And it was like, <laughs> and, it, it. and it was, and, and that's what it, all it was. But but it was this whole thing. People used to come up to me, and I'm like, "Look," I said, "Here, here," and I just used to show them the picture. Yeah, I'd be like, "Genetically, he is at the top of the tree," mm. you know. And and you know, there, there was a picture, and, and your hands next to mine. You got hands like absolute buckets <laughs> compared to mine. And people people who regard me as big, yeah. And people are like, oh, you know, you're a big dude. I'm like, no, I'm not. Yeah. I said in the grand scheme, I said I'm not. You know, you got you got people like yourself who are, you know, you just built that way. So for you, all you had to do is tidy your diet up a little bit and do a few other bits and pieces, and you get lean. Yeah. You know, you probably never looked like a bodybuilder because we, you know, we we weren't going to work on capping nah. your shoulders because it served no purpose. We were never going to try and pull your waist, and then you know, you've got quite a wide hip base anyways, which again is favourable to rugby. Yeah. You know, otherwise like, you're a spinning top, you just get knocked over <laughs> yeah, all the time. Yeah, so yeah. so there's all this stuff that genetically was in the right place but then you were like yeah but i want to see my abs i'm like no this is not happening i said we're not going to focus on seeing your abs i said if that happens as a byproduct great it, but ultimately you earn your living and it would be it would almost be an ethical and a moral you know uh, issue for me to turn around to you and go right i'm actually going to detract from what you're here for which is to make you better as a professional rugby player, somebody who earns a living out of being in this particular share. For me to then go, yeah, all right then, Hask, we'll do this. We'll get you super <laughs> yeah, lean. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it would would have been. I did try and convince you a few times. I remember coming yeah, in and going. Yeah, times. I go, yeah, I remember going, going. Yeah, but I got something. You're like, no, just do as I told you. I went, yeah, yeah, but can I just do this? You're like, no. And to be honest with you, I think I, I don't know whether I made a good. Um, you know, student or people, but I used to just do what you told me. But even interesting enough, we would check up once a week and you'd go for a, di a diary. And I'd be like, right, so I've had the brown rice, you know, it was white fish, salmon, chicken, uh, broccoli, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then the, the mix you put with the, the coconut oil and the, and the nut butter, I'd go through. And then you would check and you went, mate, there's a lot of flat whites on here. I don't remember telling you you could drink, <laughs> you could drink flat whites. I was like, yeah, but you're like, no, I didn't put that on there. You know, go, you know, and I was like, well, what about, um, you know, I don't, let's not eat a lot of fruit. And you were like, because obviously then I had, and this is where I want to go on to more stuff with you about people's understanding. My understanding of nutrition, albeit I'd worked with, with Matt Lovell, who was great with with um, with the England stuff, was again, it was still quite surface. Like nobody was tracking their calories. No one had given me a prescriptive diet um, like you had. And obviously I've now progressed to, to tracking. You know, I was 122 kg six weeks ago. I'm down to 115, 114 a bit. I'm just seeing how lean I can get to then get bigger because it gives me something to do. Yeah, yeah. And I now have that, that, that kind of knowledge base but it was really interesting that um you know we sort of tweaked to those we you know we tweaked those things and actually I, I i stuck to it and with that dedication gave me gave me the the results and it shocked it shocked me you know how how i was able to to do that but also what was sustainable and what wasn't um and i think so many people i don't know if you agree with this have absolutely no idea about nutrition or or a basic understanding like i didn't know my my knowledge came from men's health magazine so so when you told me about you know eating this specific food i was like where's the fruit where's the fruit and you were like mate when you don't you don't need to do that and i was like but what 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 do you mean? I must need fruit. Everybody needs fruit. Everyone's, you know, like if you're not cramming fucking cranberries and blueberries on your food, surely you're unhealthy. You were like, nah, just do as you're told. I'll explain why. This has got the micro micronutrients you need. These are the macronutrients you need. Just relax. Do you think that's a real common theme that nutrition have everything? No. Well, the problem is that people people look to people like yourself for an answer, right? Yeah. So if you if you didn't know better, and again, if 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 someone came to me and said, you know, give me give me what Haskell was doing at that particular point in time, because that particular point in time, there's a whole lot of goals that you need to achieve, right? So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we were doing in a certain way because of the position you were actually in. So there'd be things in there like avoid fruit, and there wasn't an avoid fruit. There was look, we're consuming huge amounts of vegetables. That's going to tick that box. You know, it wasn't avoid fruit. It wasn't this thing where you shouldn't be eating it. It certainly wasn't, you know. And you were getting your carbs from other sources, and there was a whole. There was a whole plan around what you were actually needing at that particular point. 
So when it comes to nutrition, the problem is people ask questions and they go, well, what's such and such doing? And then there's this massive emittance of certain foods or there's compensation or this other stuff. And, you know, had we wanted to trade a bunch of that veg that you were consuming and replace it with a bunch of fruit, we probably could have done that quite easily. But but we had choices. We just had, we could either go down route A or, or route B. And we went down route B at that particular point because it seemed to work well. A lot of it was rehab, right? And if your nutrition isn't on point when you're trying to rehab, your rehab becomes slow. So all of a sudden your diet has to become way stricter than it ever would before. And remember you sit in that category that we talked about before where you've got a trade-off. So the trade-off for you, so I would give you a completely different nutritional structure or nutritional plan or a way of going about your nutrition to anybody else. Because ultimately at the end of it, if you didn't get back on the field of play, your, your career was over. Mm. You know, you were done. Yeah. You know, if you didn't come back from that injury, you were done. So you'd have finished your career, what, 10 years ago, Nelly? Yeah. 10 years ago, instead of getting, what, five extra years out of it? Five, six uh, years? I think actually, yeah, I think maybe, do you know what, maybe seven, eight, yeah, seven or eight years extra. Seven, think, eight yeah. years extra. Yeah. And at that point, that could have been it. Yeah. End, end of, end of, so, so at that point, that strict regime and that strict routine and all of that stuff was there with that intent. And I would have been very blunt with you at times because of that fact. Mm. If I'm dealing with Gen Pop, I probably wouldn't be as blunt. Whereas I'm like, look, you got to realize that if you don't do what I tell you right now, and the same as what Kevin would have said, if you don't do what I tell you right now, you're not going to come out of this in the time scale that you're meant to come out of it in. Mm. You know, and and you know, me and Kevin work with uh, tons and tons of people, and because we had this dialogue between us, he would tell me ultimately what the problems were and what they needed to do from a rehab perspective, from a physio's perspective, and then I'd be like, right, what do I need to overlay this with, which is going to then bring them out the other side, probably even better than they were when they got injured. And often injuries are just an indicator of there's a weak point there. You know, some rugby, impact sports, and blah, 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 it isn't always the case. Sometimes it's an impact-based injury, which means that it's got nothing to do with weaknesses or anything like that. It's just It just happened, right? You know, you, you knock your shoulder out, whatever it might be. So there isn't that process but with you there was that process that was like right we could actually rehab you here and we could actually potentially make you a better player at the end of it make you stronger make you faster make you fitter make you be able to turn better and blah 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 so there was all this process and without that overlying nutrition that would have just been a lot slower and obviously you know the thing that you know me and kevin work with loads of people and the amount of people that were given timelines as to when they'd come back and we halved them like consistently you know, people would be like, the clubs would give them like 10 weeks and we'd be like five weeks, boom, they're back. Dad's you know? come up to me, messaged me going, hi, listen, my son, um, my son's just started training for, for rugby. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about getting protein shakes and creatine. Is that bad? I was like, well, first of all, you need to look at his diet because no amount of protein shakes is going to get you your yeah. son to where he thinks he needs to be because I've been there. I've made that mistake. Yeah, yeah. And cre- there's nothing wrong with creatine. It's the most researched thing. It's actually fantastic if you if you utilise it properly. Um, you know, it's obviously naturally occurring in your body. Topping it up is not a problem. Do you know what? It's not going to give you kidney failure. That was the big <laughs> thing. You're not going to get mutant. Rage, rage was the best one. <laughs> rage. <laughs> You know, oh yeah, he's just started on the creatine. He's got rage. And I'm like, rage. He goes, do you understand the physiology of how creatine works? I said, says, and it's giving him rage. It's affecting his brain. You know, it was like, yeah, but you, you still get it to this day. You know, people are going about it. So, so again, you know, going back. So, you buy these fat burners. Yeah. So when somebody bought a fat burner, they'd invest in something, so they pay money, a bit like a personal trainer, right? So they pay money. So now all of a sudden, there's something invested in it. So what they do is they go out and improve the diet, and they start moving more. And they'd lose weight. And instead of going, I've moved more and I've improved my diet and I've lost weight, they go, these fat burners are amazing. <laughs> and people to this day still do it. People to this day they'll do, still do it. If somebody's going to do, take the time to use a skinny jab, they're going to inject themselves with something. Chances are they're probably going to improve the diet and they're probably going to move more. Because they think, right, I need to capitalise on this because it, it's either expensive or it's it's really painful or it's something I'm doing something for. So you buy that investment and that, that investment is a great thing. And I think money is a great thing with respect to being a driver for things. Just getting someone to do something, you know, find them if they don't do it or get them to pay for it on the, the front end if they, if, if they need some motivation to do it. And this is how it used to work. So people used to buy these things and then they'd start doing things right. But then they do unsustainable things. So then... The second they ran out of the fat burners, they'd stop exercising and they'd stop improving their diet. So there's the placebo element, right? So we've always got to look at the placebo aspect of things is that, you know, you go back in the day when people used to get sugar tablets, right? They used to get sugar tablets to come back and say, yeah, I feel great. I feel so much better. And they were giving them dextrose, you know? And even in, you know, when I was at university, we used to do these studies and, and you know, you do like double blind placebos based Basically, no one knew what anyone was getting. But everybody would come back in and go, oh my God, I feel so good. 
<laughs> and I did my dissertation on creatine and in elite rugby players. Really? Yeah, and it was it was like the guys would be like, "This is I feel so good. I feel so good on this." And and then you didn't know because the double blind means that you don't know either. And then you get to the end and you be like, "Right, you were taking dextrose, and you were taking creatine, and you were taking dextrose. <laughs> and they'd be like, "No, can't be, can't be." You know, I felt phenomenal, and and you know, we used the Wingate test. I think you remember the Wingate test. Yeah. So it was, uh, yeah, just just crazy stuff, and it. it it's your consistency and you've just got to realize that there's got to be an instigator for that consistency and a lot of the time people people look at something and they see it's so far away right you know when people start on a weight loss journey mm. where they want to be is so far away from where they're at right now and that is massively discouraging right you know whatever way you cut it up you know if you look at something and this is why when people will look at you and they go yeah but you've always been in shape You've had to do a number of things repeatedly over your lifetime to remain in shape. You could quite easily right now just change all your habits, behaviors, but it's very hard to change habits and behaviors. We know this. Mm. We know this from both ends of the spectrum. So you've got, you know, someone over here who's massively overweight and they've got habits and behaviors just like you have, but they're just different. They have a different outcome. So we're always looking at what are the habits and behaviors that you do that aren't aligned with the outcome you want versus what are the habits and behaviors that, you know, there'll be things that you do right now that don't align with the outcome you want. And sometimes you've got to sit back and you've got to look at them and then you've got to figure a way of stopping doing them or replacing them in many respects. Because remember, you can't break a habit by stopping doing something. You've got to do something else. Yeah. You've got to develop a habit. In order to develop a habit, you've got to do something. You can't stop doing something. That doesn't work. And we know this. You know. So I had that with my career when I, when I was part and I was trying to get the work-life balance right about having diversity off the field, planning for the future, and also giving me more focus on my career, where I, I actually was doing too much. I was driving all over the place, trying to go into the opening of envelopes, you know, just grafting, and actually realised that was being detrimental. I didn't have the balance right. So instead of just stopping that because I wasn't able to do it, I replaced that with a focus on more recovery. I placed that on a focus with doing online courses that meant I would stay at home. So you're right, I replaced those habits so I was able to do it because you can't, you can't just stop cold and say, I'm never going to do that again. And I think that's when people go wrong when they embark on a diet or young rugby players go into performance they just try to stop everything and do a complete u-turn on the spot buy all the equipment throw all the bad food out buy all this stuff and lo and behold two days in they just can't keep it it's not it's never sustainable and, and this you know there isn't a better example out there than professional sport you look at people who come out of professional sport is that you you know when you were playing you had an output and you know i remember we talked about him before you know my dear old uh you know coach and when he retired from rugby, he actually had a heart attack brought on by the fact he wasn't exercising enough. And I remember Steve Redgrave. Do you remember Steve Redgrave, right? He trained for the London Marathon to detrain himself. Otherwise, he could have had a heart condition brought on by the fact he was so fit and his brain and his body are waiting for this stimulus on a day-to-day -day basis and it wasn't going to get it. So they said, look, what you can potentially get, and they call it athlete's heart, where basically you have a heart attack for the opposite reasons to what most people have a heart attack. You have it because your heart's waiting for this stimulus and it doesn't get it. So it goes into shock and you have this form of a heart attack. And it was, it's, it's this interesting thing when professionals leave sport, all of a sudden now their output totally diminishes, but they stop, they stop everything apart from their eating. Mm. So they're still eating and drinking the same way and they're consuming the same amount of calories, but their output isn't anywhere near as uh, what it was. So they gain weight. People are going, oh, they've let themselves, no, they haven't. They've continued as they were before. <laughs> yeah. They've just removed one large element, which now they've got no motivation to do because there is no output. So for a lot of professional sports people, and genuinely this is a mentality I've seen in professional sport, is that a lot of them despise training. They hate it. There is no love for it. They do it because they have to, you know, and then they play the sport, which is what they enjoy and what they love. They hate the training, but they love the sport, so they continue to go back to it. So they've got to constantly find something to replace that. Mm. And obviously when you've retired from movie, you've gone, right, I'm going to go do this, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. do this, I'm going to yeah. do this. And you've got to, right? Yeah. And you might not enjoy the gym, but you might enjoy BJJ. You yeah. might enjoy rolling. You might enjoy whatever it might be. And you've got to find those different outlets and you've got to find those different things. I walk more than ever before. Mm. You know, I walk everywhere. You know, me and my wife, every weekend we'll clock up probably the best part, about 15, 20 miles walking. You know, we go out and walk and obviously with the lockdown and blah, 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 that's kind of, it fits. I've also started cycling and I do all these different things. Oh, God, you haven't turned into a keno cyclist, have you? Yeah, I, I, I've got a bit of spandex now. Have you? Yeah. And all yeah. the, have you got the special shoes, clippy shoes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Real oh. real high-end bike? Yeah, it's up there. Fucking hell, mate. It's if I there. meet one more lad, like, you know, sort of just before middle ages. But you want to know something? I haven't left the house. 
I've got it hooked up on a turbo, <laughs> oh, like a proper man. digital turbo. Really? And I'm going to get off and I do the Zwift. And... Was that the, with the iPad and yep. stuff that shows the track? You know, yeah, I got yeah, conned. Yeah. I did a, um, a thing at Ministry of Sound for uh, Bridges for Music, a charity. It was Beatport was streaming it. It was streamed out of 20,000 people. There were something like 800 riders. And I turned up to get this. Do you want to do this? I thought we'd be on a Watt bike. I thought we'd be fine. Didn't... Yeah, yeah. Mate, it was a proper road bike with a saddle that I would describe as the sterilizer. Right, I got on it, mate. I was almost in tears in 20 minutes. Like, it was oh, yeah, it dinging fast. And the thing... And they didn't had, give you a proper shot. Didn't give you a proper... Sh- didn't give me anything. Just mate, nothing short. like, brutal. Right? And the thing had fucking virtual hill climbs. And I was in there, like, just turned up. It's lifting the front end up. It's lifting the front end up. Yeah, You've got, yeah, yeah. It, it's, like, hard. C- gears, pissing sweat. My ass is getting penetrated by this, this seat. My testicles <laughs> are fucking killing me. I'm sitting on a towel. And it's all for charity. And they're filming me, live streaming, yeah. coming into interviews. Mate, I've never been more livid. I called up Chloe afterwards. And I said, listen, I love charity. I love Beatport. It was a great opportunity. Some amazing people raising money. But I said, that is a full stitch up. So I'm never doing that again. Someone asked me to do a charity thing. I'm finding out what it is, how we're doing it. If it's a bike challenge, I want to be... I want to be... I want to be in a sidecar, ideally, on something. I'm not doing a fucking proper bike ride. Mate, it's a, without shorts. I mean, I've got like the full blown. Like they're expensive as well. If you get proper ones that have proper pads and they're fitted properly and blah blah blah. I've got the proper shorts. You have like cream if you're going to do long rides and sort of chafing and shit like that. And even then, you know, and I've been doing this. I've been now doing this for about six months now, and I enjoy it. I used to do a lot of cycling when I was a kid because I lived in the Lake District and it was you know everybody cycling. Yeah, and it was. I've just got into it and it's nice for my output and, and the days that I need to do a bit more work, I can actually sit on the bike and do a bit of work, you know, whilst I'm warming up and blah, blah, blah. And then, it, you know, you get into the, the, the work bits. You can choose a 30-minute workout, an hour workout, whatever it might be. And for me, my workouts are now predominantly, you know, 30, 40 minutes. You know, I don't want to do much more than that, you know, because of time and I've got other commitments and blah, blah, blah. So it's, you know, all of that. But to get on a bike with no padded shorts and not having been conditioned that I've been doing it six months. I still get on the bike with shorts on and I sit down and go, Ooh, that's a little lively, you know, and then you've got to, you get used to it and then your bum guy kind of goes a bit numb and then, but I only do like 30, 40 minutes. I've got right. friends who are doing like, this was two five, hours. This was two days. hours with hill climbs. I, I, I honestly got a woman to sweat out, folded it in half, sat on it, made no difference. I was, I was so livid that I was. It, it was, it was a nightmare. But I, sorry, we digress. But just talking about the 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 cycling stuff is mad. I, because obviously the people who follow me are either a combination of of people who look at me, and go, I want to be like him, right? I want in terms of some of the physique stuff. That's one of the yeah. things I, I've written books about and why I shared that is because people go look at the size. There's no point in me trying to explain it because of of. You know, differing things of all the stuff we've talked about. What works for me doesn't work for you. Doesn't count any of their history. If you were going to give people, maybe for the physique stuff, a, a kind of a starter kit, or even with the nutrition stuff, maybe just some of your like top four things that you would recommend people do. So you, you initially said about like first, of what's your goal and understanding your your calories. But what would you what would you say just so people can instead of trying to copy what I'm doing, get an understanding themselves of what to do as a starter pack? I know it's a bit simplistic. Uh, learn what you actually do first. Fine. So, so just writing down everything. Write down everything you consume, who you consume it with, what kind of quantities, if you can. Put all that down on paper. Because remember, this is this thing where you ask the general public, we could walk out you know, on the street and find like one person maybe, <laughs> and <laughs> we can find someone and go, look, tell me what a good diet is. Most people will answer pretty well. People know what they should and shouldn't be eating. You know, when you you write a list, this is why when people do food logs, they lie. And they don't lie by... They lie because they've got the knowledge and they know what's bad and what's what's Mm. good. So they leave out the stuff that's bad. They're not stupid. So the problem is, as an industry, I think we treat people a little bit as stupid. So if you log it all down first and write it all down, you can probably answer a lot of your questions yourself. You know, if you know what you eat and, you know, you can then start to see what's habitual because you can see it repeated and repeated and repeated, then you can look at it all and go, right... So I consume this, and it doesn't have to be a dramatic change. So there's habits and behaviors that are based around the types of foods that you eat. So, again, I always use this example because it's just a simple one. It's an easy one. Let's say you go go out with your mates on a Friday night, and you go and have a pizza every Friday night. That's a habit, and it's reinforced by a social outcome. So the social outcome, you have fun with your mates, and you're all having a pizza. Now, if you're massively overweight, you don't want to draw attention to the fact you're trying to lose weight. So... I want to help you out by giving you a better choice than the pizza without drawing attention to the fact you're dieting. So if you turn around and tell all your mates you're ordering the salad, they're going to rip it out of you. 
because that's what we're here to do. Mm. They rip it out of you, and they, there's a certain, there's a, a nice element to that in that they don't want you to change. You know, and you've got to look at that. You'd be like, oh, my mates don't support it. No, your mates don't want you to change. They want you to continue to do what you're doing because they can see you enjoying it. You and know? also sometimes it qualifies their behaviour as well. And it qualifies their behaviour. Yeah. But remember, you, you hang around with people who have similar behaviours. Yeah. That's, that's what human beings do. Yeah. So you surround yourself, and this is what happens when people lose weight. Their friend circles change. Your, your, your friendship circle, when you start training more, your friendship circles change. Because unless they fit with what you're doing, you either make them feel bad about themselves or you reinforce something that encourages them to do it as well. Or you've got people who just don't accept any of it, and then they just be like, right, I'm not talking to that person yeah. anymore because they're doing something there. So look at what you're doing. What you're doing, map it all down. You're not stupid. You know what you should and shouldn't be eating. And if you're eating something like a pizza, you need to make a plan. If you don't make a plan, you, you just guess it. You just figure it out as you go. So if you go to a pizza place on Friday night, go online, find out what the pizzas are calorically wise, and pick one that's lowering calories. The next time you're out with your mates, order that pizza. Done. Right, you just saved a couple hundred calories. Apply that same rule to every single meal of your day. You know, you've got people who will lose weight if you half the portion of butter and tomato sauce they use in a week. That's all they have to do. All you have to do is half your portions. Not even half them. What you have to do is regulate them. So instead of just liberally putting butter all over your toast, you measure out a tablespoon, put it on the side of your plate, and then when that's gone, it's gone. Or like giant things of coconut oil or olive oil in a pan. Correct. Because people don't count that stuff, do they? They never no, count just that liberally stuff. Liberally just go, blah, 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 blah. So, so again, get some get some measures, some quantifiable measures, yeah. and get used to that. You Get used to having a tablespoon of butter on your two slices of toast instead of just going, Rip. one day you've got a load of it floating on top of, you know, butter on top of butter. So you've just consumed an extra 200 calories there without even thinking about it. As far as you're concerned, you've just eaten some buttered toast. You know, so you've got to look at these things and you've got to look at them and just analyse them and go, look, where have I got calories that I can probably save? So I know that if I regulate my butter intake on my toast in the morning, I can save myself 100 calories there. Saved 100 calories, perfect. Next meal, I'm going to apply the same principle, save myself another 100 calories. Next meal, apply the same principle, another 100 calories. And essentially, the meals are the same. They taste the same. I'm eating them with the same people. I'm doing everything pretty much identical to what I was doing. I've made a couple of little tweaks, and all of a sudden I'm saving 500 calories a day. You do that over a course of week. Theoretically, you've lost a pound of fat, but theoretically, you also haven't. But you've saved 500 calories a day. Now, because you're doing that, you need to then think about movement. So if you start walking maybe an extra 5,000 to 10,000 steps a day, which isn't difficult, you know, get yourself a device and just track it and just make sure you hit that target every day. You know, you can set the rings up on an Apple Watch and what have you. So set that up. And nail that every day. It's not, you don't have to go and have an extra shower per day. You're not sweating. You don't need extra kit. You don't need any of that. Just do that walking. Now you add that into there, all of a sudden we're in deficit with the calories of your, what's going in. And you're also in surplus of what's going out. So you're now losing weight. And you've changed pretty much nothing. All you're doing is you're moving a little more, which is a nice reinforcing thing that you can get into a habit of doing because it's not too strenuous, it's not difficult, it's not challenging to your day, it's not changing your output, whatever it might be. And find a modality that enables you to do that. Go out, you know, people buy dogs to exercise more. You know, if you've got a dog, you've got to walk a couple of thousand steps a day. You've got to because the dog reinforces that. So find something that you enjoy and just do it, for crying out loud. I mean, it's, and everybody's like, oh, you've got to force this square peg into a round hole. You don't. You don't have to go to a gym. If you don't like gyms, don't go to gyms. If you enjoy classes, do classes. You know, uh, subscribe to one of these new online things. You know, my wife does fit. She hates some of the workouts on there. She loves other ones. She does the ones she loves. Because if she does she want the ones she hates, she's not going to do them anymore, yeah. right? You know, and it's that same principle. You've just got to follow that. You know, do something you enjoy that involves more movement. And then as you go along and you start progressing, you'll be like, maybe I can stomach the gym. Maybe I can go to the gym and maybe I can, you know, and I always talk about like chain gyms, big chain gyms. And, you know, I, t I talk largely to the personal training public and they're like, you know, you'll get this personal training student and there'll be like a pure gym, whatever it is, opening around the corner. And obviously not quite as relevant right now, but people are like, oh my God, they're opening down the road. They're going to take all our clients. No, they're not. What they're going to do is they're going to introduce people to exercise and a gym environment. And then when they've been introduced to it, they're going to be like, I need the next level up on this. What's the next level? Oh, there's a personal training student. I actually the need to know what I'm doing because most people haven't got a clue when it comes yeah. to training. If you watch people in the gym, because I've since I've retired, I've, I've gone into the public gym sphere. Mate, the stuff I see is just technique hanging. Lads lifting weights that they just can't possibly lift with absolutely no range of movement. Women doing mad stuff like with tiny dumbbells when their handbag weighs more than what they, 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 they're, they're pressing. People going on, on, on exercise bikes with zero resistance, on there for, for nothing, not even sweating. I'm like, you might, you, you probably burnt more calories through your neat, your non-exercise thermogenesis, with a movement than you ever were going to do on that bike. What yeah. were you doing? Somebody goes to a gym to, you know, stand on a treadmill for 20 minutes and walk. I'm like, 
So you you pay in how much a membership, and you you know not essentially you just walk for an extra twenty minutes. <laughs> It's like you know, there's that there's that famous picture of the the 24 hour I think it's 24 hour fitness it was called in America. I don't think it exists anymore, but there was a famous picture and there was a 24 hour fitness at the top of this you know like the shopping malls, and there was two escalators either side and then steps in the middle and both escalators are absolutely jammed full of people going to the gym and there's not a single person on the steps. And this is the funny thing about you know is it, it, it's the funny thing about exercise people avoid movement on a day to day basis people avoid movement to then go to a gym for an hour. Like, why would you do that? Because they don't realise that they burn more calories through general movement than right. they ever would in a single gym well, session. You look, at, you look at the statistics for NEAT, right? So you're talking about non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is basically what you burn just doing your day-to-day thing. And then you've got EAT, which is exercise activity thermogenesis, where you burn in the gym. You look at any of the statistics with that, EAT is nowhere near what NEAT is. Nowhere near. You know, you go to the gym for an hour, you will burn nowhere near what you burn throughout the course of the day. So if you can make yourself more active and things like this, so again, that goes back to my point, right? So if you can look at your diet... And look at it subjectively and go, right, I really enjoy having toast for my breakfast. A coach is going to turn around to you and go, oh, you need to eat oats for breakfast. But <laughs> calorically, it's pretty much the same. You know what I mean? There's not much in it. You know, there might be some other nutrients, especially if you, you know, put a scoop of protein powder in there. Oh, I've just added another 200 calories. You know, it, it, it goes against really what you're trying to do. So find something you enjoy. Do you need that extra protein? In some cases, yeah, people do because they're training more and they're breaking down tissue and they need a repair and blah, blah, blah. But for most people, they don't. You know, as long as they're getting enough protein throughout the course of day, they're going to be fine. They're not going to drop out of anab- anabolism or whatever, you know. And look at your diet subjectively and go, right, how can I make savings here? Most people know how to answer that, you know. Even general public know how to answer that. But most people, like, if you can't be asked to write down what you eat in a day-to-day basis, you're probably not going to be asked to do any kind of diet, any kind of diet, you know. So for me, it was always a, a standard norm. I'd be like, look, I want you to go away and write down your diet. If four days later they came back and made some cock and bull excuse about the fact they couldn't do it, I wouldn't work with them. Fine. I'd just be like, this ain't going to work, this. I've got a question for you, which is kind of the final one, because we've been talking, and I could talk to you for ages. There's so much more that I wanted to cover, so we might have to get you back for an, in another yeah. series. But you set up your coaching academy, uh, basically coaching coaches. Yep. Um, you know, wh- why was that? Is that because you saw, um, you, you felt you could help people, you saw there was a problem in the industry, or you just felt that it, you wanted to, were sick of people doing the things the wrong way and wanted to get it right? Uh, both. Both. Is that I was a coach for 20 odd years and, and made a lot of mistakes in business, made a lot of mistakes in coaching, made a lot of mistakes in nutrition, made a lot of mistakes in general and I had to spend time learning from them myself and figuring them out for myself which took a long time uh and the whole idea then is that you want to fast track people and this is kind of like coaching rugby right people now know what works and what doesn't whereas 20 years ago they weren't as you know they didn't know as much not as much data points There's now not, and yeah, yeah, of yeah. course yeah you know statistically how many you know how many miles does someone cover during a rugby game on average you know how many tackles what's your impact what you got all that stuff and then is taking all that and putting it into a modality where I can c- continue to help clients, which are the people who originally I set off on this journey to to help. And how can I continue to help clients? Well, the easy way for me to do that is to continue to help coaches. So when I stepped away from coaching, I was like, look, I'm very limited. Uh, and I talk about coaches, this to coaches an awful lot, is that you're a limited commodity, is that I can only deal with so many people. But then I could pass that information on for it to deal with hundreds of people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, potentially, if I can reach out to enough coaches and help them improve their game. So when they improve their game, it means that ultimately, you know, it's like a manager managing a team. They're winning, but they're not winning in the same capacity mm. as, a, as a as a player is, but they're still getting that elation and that, uh, that gratitude from that. So it, it was to do that. It was to help coaches progress their businesses. And business became a big thing because nobody's nobody's taught how to run a business and i've seen so many coaches over the years who leave the industry not because they're not good coaches not because they're not great at nutrition but because they can't afford to stay mm. you know so they, they they their business you know acumen is terrible so they have no idea how to uh sell payments they don't know how how much they should be charging a lot of coaches on charge. They how to market themselves, how to, how market to deal themselves. with yeah, yeah, and, and again they market themselves in the wrong way. You know, I remember having this not a dispute, but this 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 lad came just messing me up, blew on social media, and, and I looked took two seconds to look at his Instagram account. I was like, look, I said, there's nobody going to be interested in what you're doing. I said because of the way that you're just marketing yourself, and of course he was like all on the defense. He was like, no, 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 blah, and literally his Instagram was just pictures of him with his rig out, telling people what he trained that day, and I'm like how is that going to appeal to anybody who wants your coaching skills 
you've got to show them what your coaching skills are yeah. like. And then, you know, he then reverted to taking pictures of his clients. I was like, no, 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 you missed my point here. So I then went into, you know, what is the information that you can help clients with and how are you going to convey that through social media? And social media just becomes a popularity contest for many in the fitness industry. And because most people are in decent nick, you take a bunch of pictures of your ass or your chests or your rabs or whatever it might be, and you'll get popular. Hmm. You know, people love that shit. You know, I'd love to have a nice, nice perky bum. And uh, so would I. Know, That's one thing that never grew, a, unfortunately. A hairless perky bum. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I'd have like a hundred, couple hundred thousand followers on yeah. social media, but all for the wrong reasons. Yeah. I mean, do do you have you noticed? Um, sort of last question today. A universal thing with with uh, coaches in the industry, a, a common pitfall that people need to watch out for who perhaps haven't done the course. Something that you constantly see that you're like, fuck. You know, is it the so is it was the, the, the poor management on social media? Is it the the bad business management? What would you say? Uh, probably the most generalized one, but but you stop trying to impress your peers. Is that is that fitness industry? They go on to social media and then they they pitch everything to the fitness industry. You know, you you talk to the industry itself. You, it's like you're trying to impress your peers and you're trying to swing your dick in front of all your other fitness industry people instead of actually just going right. What do, the people that follow me, who are my clients, which are clearly where my business is, and if this is a business social media, uh, you know that's the whole intent, right? I want to encourage clients, so so I need to talk to them with the information that they would find useful to the point that they will probably then contact me and go, right, I'd like to employ your services in whatever capacity that might be. It might be online coaching, whatever it might be, you know, and results and stuff like that might be useful you know in some cases you know before and after pictures are, are useful but again they don't tell a full picture mm. you know you'll get a lot of coaches who they for every hundred clients they deal with they get one magnificent transformation and they tell the world about it but that isn't that isn't consistent coaching yeah you know that's that one person who would do literally everything you told them yeah and, and i see less i don't see that as impressive nowadays as i see you know people who take people with real issues and then you know, move them to a point of progressing in the right and way. And also, I imagine those coaches that actually consistently want to get better would be, you know, like reading round studies, not just, you know, not just keeping their, their knowledge base still, developing the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it, it's very difficult because you... And also, that, that knowledge base is that... The knowledge base is largely based on elitism, is that, you know, you go down and you read information about bodybuilders. You read information about physique competitors you read information about elite athletes and then you take all this application and you apply it to somebody who isn't an elite athlete isn't a bodybuilder isn't looking at these extremes and you've got to understand more about the general populace you've got to understand more about people and i think you know i grew up in an environment where i was surrounded by people i grew up in a pub so one of the things i learned very young is is how to communicate with people and if you're very good at communication, you'll be perfectly fine in the coaching world because ultimately coaching is about communicating it's being able to listen process that information that you hear and turn it into something useful and that's what's kind of social media is about is that is that if someone reading your social media going to take some value from what you've just said if the answer is yes you've then got to then answer who is that person who's going to take value you know so you get your rig out and you put your workout on there who's going to take value from that mm. you know who's going to be able to go away and do that workout because if you posted your workout on social media there's not going to be many people are going to complete that mm. You know, you know, it's a very finite number of people that are going to be able to go and do that. Other than that, it's you just swinging your dick. Yeah, it's you going on there, going, "Look at me! Look at, look <laughs> yeah, how intense and amazing." I do a lot of that, though. I do do a lot of look at me. Yeah, but it, but again, that you know that that is also that's a character thing as well, though. Mm. Is that I don't see a problem with that. No, well, that's if, what I, why I am anyway. Everything I do is a performer. That's how I, I embrace everything. I don't, you know? I don't see any problem with that if that's the nature of you. But don't force it. No, you know, I'm not. I'm not a massive entertainer. When I do videos, I'm quite droney. I'm quite boring. I'm not. I'm not like you know cracking jokes and blah blah blah. And this is where you've got to take advantage of the things you're good at. You know, you you were funny. Hmm. You were entertaining. You're you you know you you you're comical. You, you can tell great stories. You, you know these are all things that you're good at. So leverage them. Yeah. You know, leverage them. Make use of them. You've got a great rig. You know, use it. Yeah. Use I, it to your good. I always know. laugh when you post a rig, you have in the past posted a rig shot, and you'll even say just because you rig shot because of, and yeah, I'll be like, yeah. come on, Phil. And it's, it, and it, but it, it doesn't have a lot of context no, for me. No. It doesn't have a lot of context because, you know, I've, I've had that point in my life where I'm like, look, I want people to, you know, look at me physically and go, well done, Phil. Yeah. And, and I've had that. And there was a point in my life where I really craved that because yeah. that was, that was the far cry from what I'd grown up with. And, and then that gets older. And this is the thing that I think comes with maturity as well, is that as you get older, you look, you know, I've got more value to the world than that. Yeah. You know, but is that part still part of my value? Yes, it is. 
you know. Of course, but I think but it's the fact you can identify. So many people act and they don't have the self awareness. And self awareness for me is such a powerful tool in terms of helping you self develop, helping you recognise your recipe for success, but also recognise where your pitfalls are and manage them. Because if you didn't manage the confidence around your body image, it'd eat you up at some point. But it would it'd get you later on, or if you weren't able to move it, you have to keep managing all those things. It's not stuff that you, you know, I think psychological elements and mental health stuff it's this a constant work in progress you're never just over any of this stuff i think oh massively and as someone coming from elite sport that would always be something that would concern me with you know all of my friends all of my colleagues that have come away from things that were magnificent you know in their time they were magnificent and i talked to this about uh you know i interviewed dallas uh dallas page Darren dallas page who was you know wwe and he used to like, you know, he performed in front of millions of people, like millions, you know, on, on, online, watching them live and, and obviously in that place, like literally millions of people. And again, I think rugby probably, once you take on the media and think, yeah. like, it's probably millions of people right at a time. And you've gone from that to where you are now. And and you've got to be able to take that with a pinch of salt. And you've also got to take it with, this is just life. This is how it's moved on. And now I might not get that, but I've got to get that in some other way. And and the problem is, is that if you don't get a hold of that well, and again, there's a lot of player charities out there now. There's a lot of psychology behind players post. Yeah, you know, I like restart post, the charity. I'm a trustee of. We do a lot of stuff. Massive, like, yeah. right? Because it, it does become psychologically, right. you know, people fall into pits of depression because there's nothing anymore. Right. You know, you you've got nothing to chase. You've got nothing to go after. And I think that's so important. I think in life is that you've always got to have something that chase you. Now, for me, there's. You know, my family is a massive motivator. For me now, my business is a massive motivator. And there's things that are chasing it. And it's you're chasing numbers again in many respects. And it's, it isn't just about the money. It's not about, you know, making... Business isn't always defined by, you know, business success isn't always defined by how much money your business is worth. It's how successful it is and doing what it's... And also how much you the, enjoy it as well. You're course, finding something yeah, you love is so yeah. important. You know, there isn't, there isn't anything I don't enjoy about my day. I look forward to getting up and working. You know, every single day I, I, I get up and I'm like, I enjoy working, but I also miss time on my family because of work and, and I miss that and I, you know, but I'm craving everything. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's days where I don't get in the gym because I'm busy working, but I don't miss the gym because I love my work and there's days where I'm out with my family and I want to train and I'm like, and I don't miss the training because, and, and I think that's a fantastic place to be in, but I think it's so difficult when you come away from something that's so magnificent and so great and so, such a spectacle and it was something again I talked about with Dallas and I talked about with Ollie and you know I've talked about with you before is that it's to come away from that and then divert that to something else where and I think you've and and I could be wrong but I think you've done it pretty damn well I think like you say it's a work mm. in progress I think there's stuff there that probably mentally you've still got to deal with yeah. and you've still got to handle and you've got to find different avenues to channel that whatever it might be you know all these emotions and all these things that used to be dealt with with you know, your, your old man patting you back saying we yeah. played and, and, and that's a different thing to a thousand pe thousands and thousands of people applauding you and, you know, whatever it might be. And and they're different things, but I think people have just got to contend them with in different ways. And social media gives you an avenue, but I think it'd be an avenue that can dig a very deep hole if you get it right. It can unravel you as much as it can build you massively, up. Massively, right, massively. Um, if people want to follow you or, or like coaches, what, are you still doing the academy stuff now? Yep. If, if, where, where can people find information about that? Uh, coaching Academy is advancedcoachingacademy.com. Uh, so you'll find information about the academy and what the academy offers. Uh, obviously, if you've got questions about that, I'll fire that through my social media, which uh, is just at the PT coach, which is my Instagram, which is probably the most, uh, the channel I use the most. LinkedIn I use quite a bit now. Uh, which is just Phil Learney. You'll find me on there. And, you know, my new business, uh, which is Human24, which is hmn24.com. You'll find me on there. And, and you know, that's all about human performance. We talk about every narrative possible with respect to human performance. We do a, a big podcast, uh, the Live On Form podcast, which we get guests on very much like yourself. And we talk about, you know, performance and how performance has overlaid that narrative over, over people's lives. And then, you know, we've got products coming out in, in April, which again are all focused around performance. We talked about creatine and caffeine before. And, you know, we've taken 20 years, me and my business partner, who's a, who's been in the, the, the supplement industry, the sports nutrition industry for, for 20 plus years. And, you know, learn a lot of things along that time and so have I with respect to what people are looking for and what people are striving for. And we've basically encapsulated that into this this new brand, which is something that I've always wanted to do. But throughout a career as a coach, and, you know, especially when you've built up quite a, a decent following, it's very easy just to switch across to something like sports nutrition and go, right, I'm just going to bring out some 
you know, whatever it might be. And again, you know, you've experienced yeah. this is that it's very easy because the market's there. There's people there looking for, you know, they want to buy protein or they want to buy whatever it might be. And and we didn't want to go down that route. And I didn't want to go down that route. And I've avoided it probably for the best part of 10 years because it was always there for me. And it's very easy for me to bring a range out and do whatever it might be. But we've just avoided it for that reason. And we always said we'd do something together. Opportunity arose. So we've, we've developed Human24 and that's all about human performance. It's about everybody, day-to-day -day people, professional athletes, whatever it might be, being able to optimize their day. You know, you get up in the morning, you want neural performance, you want physical performance, you want hydration. And then how do you then follow that through throughout the day, whether it's family time, business time, whether it's, it's training, whatever it might be. And and that's our narrative. That's what we're all about. And, you know, we're about that human performance, and that 24-hour time. So hence the human 24 Well, mate, 100% when that's all up and running and you're into it, I'm going to gonna get involved sure. and, and have a, a listen. Because you know how much human performance for me, even if I'm not an athlete, you know, we get one body, we get one mind, and you want to make the most of it because it affects so much of your life and, and not managing those things and, and seeing if you can push your envelope and make you better. Can I tweak my nutrition? Can I tweak my performance? Yeah, yeah. Can I be better at recovery? Um, these things are essential. Well, and, listen, in the, and in the context of your situation, right? 100%. You know, it 100%. changes all the time, right? 100%. Well, listen, thank you so much for that. It was absolutely fascinating. You've got all his um, his details there. Guys, that was What a Flanker, the podcast with Phil Lerney. If you like this podcast, please share, please subscribe. Don't forget that it's also a YouTube show uh, and we're across all of the usual uh, platforms as well. Phil, you're a legend. I'll catch you again soon. Bye, mate.